The winds of change are blowing outside. I don't know what it's like where you are, but my hat blew off as I got out of my car. The winds of change are blowing through the corridors of Westminster. Even Quentin Letts, the ultra-conservative commentator on the Daily Mail, said this week that if the Tories don't get rid of their leader, he'll be voting for Jeremy Corbyn. I find that almost impossible to believe, having known him for 30 years, but it's a sign of the times. Brexit is blowing a gale. What kind of Brexit? Will we Brexit or not? It's all now up for grabs. Tony Blair was back on the field this week. He's got a plan. His plan is that MPs should vote down any Brexit deal and then vote for a second referendum with Remain on the ballot paper. Explosive stuff. But the winds of change in the Persian Gulf are perhaps the most dangerous mistral of them all. And talk of mistral leads me to the mystery of what happened to Jamal Khashoggi in his country's consulate in Istanbul in the week. Although, it's no longer that much of a mystery. United States law enforcement said this evening that they have now seen and heard the audio and video of the murder most foul in Istanbul. This was a premeditated affair, according to the Turkish authorities, and the United States authorities appear to agree because 15 people were flown in to Istanbul who promptly flew out again on the evening of the alleged murder. So they were in the country for less than 24 hours, and the identities of the 15 have been released by Turkish security. The Saudis claim that they were 15 tourists and they flew in and left less than 24 hours later because they'd seen all there is to see in the great city of Istanbul. It's a bit like those two Russian tourists that went to Salisbury to see the world's largest clock, or was it Spire? Uh, the Turks and the Americans are in no doubt, especially when you see the identity of the 15 that flew in and out so quickly. They included a forensics expert whose professional speciality is field post-mortems. He carries out the fastest decimation of bodies of anyone in Saudi Arabia, usually when they're already dead, I presume. In this case, who knows who did the deed? Who knows what actually happened? But we do know that what happened was clearly intended to happen. Frank Gardner, uh, never knowingly underinformed uh, from British security sources, says that he thinks that Khashoggi had a heart attack whilst inside the building. Well, if he did have a heart attack, you'd have to ask what brought it on and why it required him to be chopped up into pieces and carried out of the consulate in cake boxes, because that's what they authorities say happened. And I stress, the Turkish authorities are not the only authorities in this case. Jamal Khashoggi was a permanent resident of the United States of America. And even worse for the Saudi royal family, he was a star columnist on the Washington Post, arguably the world's most famous newspaper. And of course, a bastion of liberalism, and liberalism is already on the offensive against Donald Trump across a pretty broad front. And Saudi Arabia has just been added to that front. Turkey itself now has a real difficulty. It rivals Saudi Arabia for the allegiance of Sunni Muslims in the world, a very, very significant section of the world's population, uh, well over a billion Sunni Muslims in the world, spread, of course, from Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, all the way to the Persian Gulf and South Asia too. And Turkey 
is probably winning the allegiance of more than the Saudi royal family at this point in time. Saudi Arabia is effectively ruled by a 33-year-old man, Prince Mohammed bin Sultan, the rock star prince, you might remember him. Well, that's at least what he was called by the same British media just months ago that is now calling for, metaphorically speaking, his head. And how can they do otherwise? Prince MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, is the effective ruler of the country. Therefore, he is in pole position in the various foreign policy disasters in which the Saudi government is involved. The, the war in Yemen, which, according to the United Nations, has left 80% of the population of Yemen on the brink of starvation by the end of this year, where there is a cholera epidemic, where there are tens, maybe scores of thousands of dead people as a result of Saudi bombardment, missiles and aircraft. It's no secret that most of those bombs and missiles are sold to Saudi Arabia by the United States and Britain. You see where I'm going here. If MBS, if the Saudi government, has suddenly moved on the death of a single journalist into a position of being persona non grata, how will it be possible for business as usual to continue? You just heard on the news that business people are voting with their feet. Richard Branson, for one, uh, has pulled out of an important trade fair in Riyadh uh, this weekend, and many others are doing so. The Museum of Natural History came under inordinate pressure in London yesterday because the Saudis had booked a hall in their premises to celebrate Saudi National Day. Not much to celebrate, if I'm any judge, in the corridors of power in Riyadh because everything just changed. Erdogan cannot possibly accept this blood insult to his country on his soil. He had already taken the side of Qatar in the convoluted comic opera standoff between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Be sure he will now redouble that support. He may even get involved in regime change efforts inside Saudi Arabia itself. It will be difficult for Trump to maintain his business as usual stance although it would be tricky for him to disengage from it because, by all accounts, Donald Trump's family have, shall I say this way, close relations with MBS, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. And, of course, the uh, Democrats, the Clintons, both of them, had very close relations with the Saudi regime too. But that will not stop liberal America now going on the offensive for one of their own. We'll be talking to the most distinguished Arab journalist, Abdel Bari Atwan, editor-in-chief of the London-based news site Rai Al Yom, and the founder and editor-in-chief of, once upon a time, the most famous newspaper in the Arab world, Al Quds Al Arabi. And he, I have no doubt, will give his point of view. I just want to add this and nothing more. This is not God against the devil. The Turkish regime has killed many a journalist, from Serena Shrim, the journalist who uncovered the relations between the Turkish government and the early parts of the insurgency in Syria, and who was mysteriously killed in a road accident shortly after her broadcast to that effect. Erdogan has imprisoned scores, maybe hundreds, of journalists, especially following the attempted coup against him just a year or so ago. Neither is it the case that other countries don't murder journalists. Many of them have, many of them do. But there's journalists and there's journalists, and I just have the feeling that this will be the straw that broke the camel's back in regard to relations 
between the West and Saudi Arabia. None of this that I've been saying is speculation. The Saudis are not really even trying to dispute the now prevailing narrative. It is remarkable, given the amount of money they've spent on media and on public relations, that they've not been able to muster any counter story. Because they seem not to have known that the Turkish bugged the Saudi consulate and every consulate. In fact, every embassy and every consulate in the world is probably bugged by the host country. They don't seem to know what an Apple watch is. But Khashoggi was wearing one and thus recorded at least the early stages of his demise. I suppose the watch stopped ticking when the bone saw started buzzing. It's a gruesome, grotesque story. But as I wrote on day one, the day after it happened, you can still see what I wrote. I'm still proud of what I wrote. This was a murder, which was not just a crime, but was a very considerable blunder. All that, plus fracking, plus climate change, and who knows what else will blow into the studio on this blustery night. A uh, tweet has come in uh, of some import already. Fracking is going ahead in Lancashire. It has been given the green light by the High Court. This is outrageous. Fracking is banned in both Wales and Scotland. England is yet again penalised because there's no Parliament nor Assembly to speak for us. And that's from... Uh, rebel without a pause, but I can't actually read the rest of it. But anyway, if you've got a point of view on that fracking story, we're doing that next in the second hour. It's from the Communicipalist. No, this is another one. Yeah, it's from the Communicipalist. He's an old friend of the show and a very powerful writer. I'm not sure if having an English parliament or assembly would necessarily have stopped it, but it is food for thought. 0344 499 1000. Now, my first guest is often described as the last Arab, not least by me. Uh, he is the, I think, best known, best loved Arab journalist. He is now the editor-in-chief of the London-based news site Rai al Yum. I've travelled with him in the Arab world. He's a bigger star there than me. Abdul Bari, welcome to the show. You are a star, George. Everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, these are very serious times, aren't they? I knew as soon as this happened that the issue was not going to go away easily, and I was certain that there would be evidence from the Turkish side, and it now seems there is. The Americans are now saying that they have seen and heard the audio and video, which must be ex-certificate stuff. If we assume, for the purposes of argument, that uh, the Saudi Arabian government did this and in a premeditated way, as is alleged. Uh, why would they be so stupid? You know, they are so stupid because they used to do things more than that. And what started action is a complete silence from the West and even support. Look what they, have, what they did in Yemen and what they are doing in Yemen. They are bombing, you know, the poorest people maybe in the third world. And they are killing more than 15,000 people and injuring at least 50,000 people. So what happened? You know, most of the Western countries are supplying Saudi Arabia with the most sophisticated weapon to continue killing those poor people for the last four years. So that's why, actually, now uh, people are saying, where is the Western reaction? For example, President uh, Trump and his colleagues in the United States who lectured us for years about human rights, about dictatorship, about freedom of expression, what they are saying. You know, I was personally, George, I was shocked yesterday when I heard President Trump talking to Fox News, his favorite channel, saying that, you know, okay, you know, maybe he didn't leave the 
a Saudi consulate in uh, Istanbul. But, you know, we have actually $110 billion dollar, uh, worth of weapon deals to Saudi Arabia. Well, let, let, let's hear, like uh, Barry, let's hear him actually saying that. I would not be in favor of stopping a country from spending $110 billion, which is an all-time record, and letting Russia have that money and letting China have that money, because all they're going to do is say, that's okay, we don't have to buy it from Boeing, we don't have to buy it from Lockheed, we don't have to buy it from Raytheon and all these great companies. We'll buy it from Russia, we'll buy it from China. So what good does that do us? There are other things we can do. Khashoggi is not a United States citizen, is that right? Or is that right? He's a permanent resident, okay. We don't like it, John. We don't like it, and we don't like it even a little bit. But as to whether or not we should stop $110 billion from being spent in this country, knowing they have four or five alternatives, two very good alternatives, that would not be acceptable to me. Okay, but we're looking for the answer, and I think probably you'll have an answer sooner than people think. Well, Abdul Bari, they, it's clear that he's not what he's not going to do. Uh, he did imply that he was going to do uh, something. But if I was advising MBS, if you were advising MBS, you would have been bound to say to him, that one Washington Post journalist for the West is worth any number of thousands of dead Yemeni schoolchildren. That's the melancholy truth. You can kill Syrians, you can kill Yemenis, but if you kill in such a gruesome way an important journalist on the world's most important newspaper who's living under American protection, you're asking for really big trouble. Now, would nobody have advised him of that, or is he such a person that wouldn't listen to such advice? You know, George, this man, actually, he is the son of the king. He never been educated on the West or outside his uh, country, Saudi Arabia. He is surrounded by the most stupid, arrogant people on the Middle East. So nobody is advising him, actually, or dare to advise him. He believes he is the most expert in everything, you know, in, in, in diplomacy, strate strategy, weapons, everything. So nobody honestly can say to him, sir, what you are saying is wrong. What you are planning to do is extremely dangerous and could undermine the stability of your country or the stability of your royal family. This is the problem, George. You know, he doesn't listen. And nobody does actually to say to him, this is right and this is wrong. So to go and kill a journalist, and you know, I know him personally. I know him for 40 years at least. And he's a very nice, very decent guy. Uh, despite I disagree with him, I'm talking about Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, despite I disagree with him in several issues, but he is very decent. He respects the other point of view, to be honest. And he supported uh, Mohammed bin Salman. He supported the war in Yemen. He supported actually arresting uh, a lot of uh, princes, a lot of businessmen under the pretext of fighting uh, uh, corruption. So why he did it to him? This is, this is a big question. He believes he can get away with it without any problem. Nobody should actually say to him, you are doing wrong doing. That's, that's the problem we are facing in the Middle East. Now, you have heard President Trump, the leader of the free world, the leader of the most sophisticated country, which actually invaded Iraq, killing more than 2 million Iraqis under the pretext of democracy and human rights. The same thing, he changed the regime in Libya and killed at least, you know, more than, I mean, his government or his country, more than 30,000 Libyans in, under the pretext of human rights and to save the Libyan people. So this is the problem. When the people, when, like Mohammed bin Salman, heard, President Trump saying that we are there for money. They cannot live for 12 minutes without our protection. They need us. They are very rich. We must have our share of their wealth. So when he hears something like this, you know, uh, uh, definitely, definitely he thinks Donald Trump will protect me. Donald Trump actually wouldn't let anybody to hurt me. So I will be there. I can buy, you know, America and can buy a lot of Western countries. George. For 
Western government apologized to Saudi Arabia because actually Saudi Arabia threatened to stop uh, business with them. Germany, uh, you know, Sweden, uh, Spain, uh, and could be soon Canada. Why they apologized to Saudi simply because they criticized the human rights there. So well, this, this may be, though, I mean, I take your point about what President Trump said, but it may be the straw that breaks the camel's back, whether Trump likes it or not, because I saw a statement from the editor of the Washington Post tonight. She said uh, they they have done this to the wrong newspaper and they've done this to the wrong editor. And I get the feeling that this will now become part of the liberal establishment's war on Trump, not least because... Trump and his son-in-law in particular have very close relations uh, with MBS and they're vulnerable on it. And it will be forgotten that the Clintons were equally uh, close to the uh, Saudi regime. But what will Turkey do now? This is a very big blood insult to them. Uh, what do you expect President Erdogan to do? George, my friend, I am not really optimistic like you. I am not really trusting, you know, that the American administration will do anything. You know, okay, they talk, but when it comes to action, I think in the end they will bury everything under the carpet. That's 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 what we learn from our experience as a Middle Eastern journalist or a Middle, Middle Eastern writer. When we talk about Turkey, look, you know, Turkey saying that we have documents, we have videos, we have. Uh, audio tapes re recording uh, Khashoggi being tortured before he was killed. Okay, and today, for example, they told us that they are receiving a high-profile delegation from the Saudi government to participate in the investigation. To you know, they are accused of being behind this crime. To participate on the investigation? So it, it is really also other things, George. You know, they used to have uh, the, the priest uh, Brunson, Andrew Brunson. Today he was released. Immediately, what happened? The American administration is very happy. They released the man. So immediately the Turkish lira jumped. Immediately the stock and exchange jumped. So it, and there are a lot of talks that, okay, the man is dead. Well, let us move on. I think that's that's the problem because money talks, George. Money talks. This is the problem. Well, it's as as Bob money. Dylan says, money doesn't talk; it swears. Uh, let Let's look at Saudi Arabia internally. Then, as you alluded earlier, uh, there was this crackdown on corruption, as it was described. Uh, the rich Carlton was turned into a prison, uh, a very comfortable one. Uh, but even uh, many of MBS's own relatives, members of the ruling family, were either literally or metaphorically hung upside down until the money fell out of their pockets. Uh, so there's already a lot of opposition to MBS inside not just the country, but the ruling family itself. Do you think this will change the calculus in that regard? Yeah, I believe there are huge pressure internally from the Saudi royal family uh, practiced on uh, President uh, or Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. You know, the, the, he destroyed three major pillars of the Saudi rules. The first one, the royal family, he kicked everybody out. He doesn't listen to them. And he imprisoned them. And this never happened before. This is one thing. Second thing, he imposed, he destroyed the business community completely. When, wh why he did that? Simply because under the pretext of corruption, fighting corruption. But in order to control the economy, to control the, the, the establishment there, to control the money. The third uh, pillar of the Saudi was the media. He actually you know, destroyed anybody in Saudi Arabia who owns uh, you know, private uh, television stations or newspapers, so, and he actually has a full control on the media in Saudi Arabia. So also the people, he now imposing taxes on the people. So the Saudi people are struggling. And the, the, the cost of living is extremely high because of this direct or indirect hidden or declared taxes imposed on the people for the first time in, in, in their life. So this is the problem. Now he's under pressure. So that's why he doesn't want any critics. 
He doesn't want any media outlet to talk about his corruption, to talk about his iron fist, to talk about how he actually uh, indulged or pushed the country in a war for the last four years, which is an unwinnable war. And it actually destroyed the image of the Saudi royal family and also the image of, of the, the country itself. And it is a war of attrition. A lot of Saudis are killed now in this war, but they actually uh, doesn't say, they don't say the news, they don't spread the news about that. They keep silent about it because they don't want internal repo, uh, revolt against this kind of war and this kind of atrocities committing by Mohammed bin Salman. Now, finally, uh, I, I consulted uh, an old friend of yours and mine in Beirut earlier today on this subject, on this story. He's a wise man, as we both know. Uh, yeah. He said that the word on the street is that MBS is like a young Saddam. Uh, that these are the kind of apparently crazy things that Saddam Hussein used to do, uh, reaching out, killing people beyond borders, thinking he could get away with anything at all. Uh, do you see any uh, comparison uh, between the two in that regard? Yes, I can see some comparisons, to be honest. But Saddam Hussein, when he started his reign in, in, in Iraq, Yes, he uh, actually, a lot of his uh, opponents, even his comrades and the Ba'ath Party. But he managed actually to do a lot of achievement uh, inside this, you know, despite that I disagree with completely. You know, uh, Iraq was the most advanced country in the Middle East when it comes to education, for example. He tried to build a very strong army, and he was actually believing in Arab unity. He also, he was against the Zionist project. But when you look at the Mohammed bin Salman, for example, he is actually very close friend of the Israelis. He is actually, the, you know, doesn't do any achievement inside the, 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 his country. And the only achievement is to let women drive, which is supposed to be, you know, about 100 years ago, not now. And they consider it as a gift from him to the Saudi women, which is not, to be honest. So, you know, there is no achievement, and, but to go that far and start assassinating people, uh, and, and on the West in particular, uh, you know, somebody who is, uh, you know, a, a contributor to the Washington Post, one of the best newspapers or the well-known newspaper in the world, I think this is a challenge, and this is, to be honest, is, is miscalculating, and I wouldn't be surprised if he pay a heavy price for that, but... We have to keep the pressure on. We have to tell the people, money grabbing in the West that, look, you should listen. You should respect human rights. You should actually side with those people. You know, you made mistakes during Saddam Hussein's time. You shouldn't make mistakes now. That's, that's the message. It should be clear. Well, um, Abdul Bari Atwan, uh, the editor of Rai al Yum, my only advice to you, you don't need it is not to go visiting any Saudi Arabian consulates uh, anytime soon or even in the medium or long term. Thanks very much for joining us. Abdul Bari Atwan, very important journalist in the Arab world who knew Khashoggi, the apparently murdered uh, Saudi journalist, for 40 years and describing his character to us. Where do you stand on these issues? Do you think, as... Abdul Bari seemed to be saying in the beginning that the Saudis will pay no price uh, for this, or as he seemed to be saying at the end, that they may well pay a price if pressure is kept up uh, severely enough. 0344 499 1000. Or you can text, email, or above all, tweet at George Galloway at Talk Radio. We heard earlier from uh, Abdul Bari Atwan, one of the great Arab journalist talking about someone he knew well, Jamal Khashoggi, who is almost certainly murdered and it would appear brutally dismembered and carried out in small boxes from the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul. Abdul Bari had a view on where this comes from, where what mentality it flows from. Let's balance that a bit. My uh, my executive producer, Tamar Asfahani, uh, has joined me now in the studio. Tamar, 
how does this story look to you and what did you think about what Abdel Bari said? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting story. Saudi Arabia obviously has a uh, history of dealing with outspoken individuals. Um, you know, I've lived in Saudi, so, you know, we lived there during the first Gulf War, which is quite quite an interesting time. Um, but th the rules are very, very different. But what we have to remember is, you know, despite the uh, human rights atrocities that are reported in Saudi Arabia, despite the situation in Yemen, despite the proxy war between Saudi and Qatar that's going on, um, they are... There's a lot of fronts. There are a lot of fronts, but you have to remember, this is a monarchy, right? So with all of this that's going on, yes, it's wrong, and yes, it's not right, but this is a monarchy in the defense of its realm. How is it any different to what the MI5 agents have given carte blanche to, to do in this country, which we discussed last week so it's a balancing act now i'm not suggesting that they are innocent i'm not suggesting that what they did was right i'm not suggesting that um, Hamad bin salman actually is uh, necessarily a great leader i don't believe that saudi has had a great monarch since uh, king faisal in the 60s that's my personal opinion from from uh, the region However, and he was killed by one of his he was own killed, family. He was killed by his nephew. Yeah, um, you know. So, so there is a lot of corruption, but we can't make accusations or assumptions. For example, that he's in cahoots with the Zionist lobby, or that he's in cahoots with uh, Israel, or they're friends with Israel. What we have to look at is the hard evidence and the facts here. And the hard evidence and the facts are: uh, Khashoggi went into the the embassy in Saudi for uh, papers for his uh, marriage to his fiance at, at the time. He didn't come out. The discrepancies that we're getting from Saudi Arabian government are, well, he was in there for a few minutes to an hour. I mean, come on, it's either a few minutes or it's an hour, you know. And again, like I said, Saudi Arabia has got history. Uh, a couple of months ago, up to a couple of years ago, social media uh, uh, influencers, as they're called, people that post blogs and vlogs and that kind of stuff on they, the internet. They forced the Prime Minister of Lebanon to yeah. uh, to go on Saudi TV and, uh, and uh, demur against his own policy yeah absolutely um, and and this is the kind of power they they have and it, it's very interesting because saudi holds this power and it has done what what the whole world is afraid of is the 1970s oil crisis that's what the problem is here saudi leads opec so we have a country that is effectively in charge of all the oil production that can change the, the price of oil whenever it wants to restrict the amount of barrels that it produces and it has a huge impact on uh, the kind of global oil and the markets as as a result so that's what people are fearing so that's what that's what we've got to remember is that saudi has that power now if we move away, and we'll be talking about this a little bit later on in the show, obviously, with the fracking and with the environmental, the intergovernmental environmental uh, and, change and plan. And the climate change and issue. And the climate yeah. change issue. If we move away from fossil fuels into renewable energy, how much power then do we give Saudi? And how much business do we have? And the clip that we played of Donald Trump and uh, Abdul Bari Atwan's uh, a comment about the, the, the financials of these deals are also very, very important. Thanks for that. Tamar, tell me what you think, dear listeners, 0344-499-1000. That's the number to call. Uh, here is some of the paperwork that's coming in. Mal says, uh, it isn't funny. Um, no, he says, it isn't funny when the stock market starts collapse, collapsing. It's the federal banks doing. But when it's on the rise, it's all his doing. I think he's talking about Trump. But there may be an earlier tweet that I've not got. Uh, Mary says, to be honest, George, I'm very confused. Why now are these businesses like Virgin cutting ties with the Saudis? And the news suddenly interested. And Daryl Irvin says, so the BBC is not only a government mouthpiece, it's also a Saudi Arabia mouthpiece. And we pay £155 a year for the privilege. Well, this, I think, is a reference to the... I think, extraordinary statement uh, by Frank Gardner, the security correspondent of the BBC, a man who paid a very high price in Saudi Arabia at the hands of murderous terrorists who killed one of his colleagues and paralyzed him for the rest of his life. He said that, uh, that uh, he understood that Khashoggi had suffered a heart attack in the consulate. That's not what the Americans are saying. They're saying they have heard audio and seen video of him being tortured and murdered. And they concur with the Turkish authorities' take that he was not just murdered, 
but chopped into pieces. Now, let's take a call, shall we, from Lucy on this issue of the Saudi prince and the event at the British Museum. A night at the museum, Lucy. Yes, the night at the museum, which was for um, the Saudi embassy yes. um, to gain funding, which, you know, I think in, in respect of what has happened is, is blood money. They came um, under a lot of pressure to cancel, but they didn't, did they? No, no, and it is shocking, really, when you think that the, most of the trustees are appointed by the government. Well, the uh, Natural History Museum would say, of course, that their mission is to raise funds wherever they can get it. And this booking was made long before this apparent murder took place. What do you say to that? Uh, I, I, well, in, in respect of, the, um, of what happened and how important um, and how awful it is, especially today when we, you know, we understand how he may have been removed in pieces um, from, from the um, Saudi embassy in Turkey. Um, you know, I just think that the money is never important enough. You know, they should have, they should have cancelled this event. Maybe, and a lot of people think that. Um, they have put out a statement explaining their position. People can get it on the internet. But it's not just, and we shouldn't uh, put all the blame on the Natural History Museum because, of course, every newspaper in the land, from The Guardian to The Telegraph, yeah. took lavish, paid advertising from Saudi Arabia to welcome... MBS on his recent state visit to London. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that which they didn't pay myself. for, they got in acres of positive coverage of this rock star prince that was suddenly in our midst. And a lot of people wrote things, including, by the way, in American press, in the New York Times in particular, uh, that they're going to uh, consider egg, if not blood, on their face now. A lot of columnists, a lot of reportage welcoming this modernizer, this reformer who's yes, yes. so modern uh, he seems to have gone back to medieval methods of execution. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I mean, it wasn't just um, papers like The Guardian that had these adverts. I mean, there was adverts at the um, at British airport. There was bands. There was billboards everywhere. I remember the one yes. well at Westfield. Uh, yeah. which uh, uh, was so gigantic it was almost causing uh, car accidents as people <laughs> stopped in, on the roundabout to uh, see what it says. Now, here's the London Natural History Museum said on Thursday that the embassy had made the booking two months ago and emphasised its commitment to commercial bookings, enabling commercial events to take place outside of public opening hours in our iconic spaces, brings the museum an important source of external funding, which allows us to maintain our position as a world-class scientific research centre and visitor attraction, the statement said. It goes on, but it's in a way the same kind of statement that Donald Trump made, isn't it? That business is business. Yes, yeah. And I mean, before, I mean two months ago, even though this, this horrible occurrence hadn't happened, they were still responsible for many Yemen, Yemeni deaths, yes. um, including uh, bombing, was it a children's hospital? Uh, oh, many of those. The school bus was the big uh, the latest bus, yeah. one, uh, which killed a lot of children uh, on that uh, bus. It, it was quite a, as they would say in Yes Minister, Quite a brave decision by the Natural History Museum to right, l let out their iconic spaces to the yes. Saudi Arabian embassy. And um, it's, it was guaranteed to be controversial, you know, one way or the other. Yes, yeah. Well, brave, brave is is a is a questionable statement. Well, bra brave, Stupid. brave with a heavy dose of Whitehall you. Mandarin irony in the inflection is, I suppose, what I was trying to uh, achieve. Uh, Lucy, thanks very much for that call. It's important to hear from the listeners, 0344 499 1000. And you can also write to me. I'm not getting my tweets uh, in the proper form, but I will in the second hour and uh, tuck into those. We are going to be talking in the second hour about fracking. 
I'm not an expert on fracking, uh, but I am going to be talking to some experts. The one thing I'd say is it's a rather ugly word, and when something has an ugly name, it never gets off to a great start with me. On the other hand, it is energy. It is fuel uh, that is uh, coming out of the ground like other forms of energy. Here, I've got some now. Fracking is going ahead. That's communist I've done that. Mark says, you only believe Western security services when it suits you. I have no doubt that the Saudis have murdered Mr. Khashoggi, but I'm also equally sure that the Russians tried to poison Skripal. But I can do that because I don't have an agenda. Well, I'm not able to speak about Skripal uh, and the security services I'm trusting in this case, are the Turkish, who, whatever else they are, are not a Western security service. Chloe in London says, why was Khashoggi so important for the Saudis? Why kill him? He wasn't very well known. His columns are not even that strong on anti-Saudi sentiment. What did they get from silencing a man who was relatively, seemingly harmless? An American, backed by a powerful Saudi family. These are very good questions, Chloe. I don't have the answer to them. That's why I started out by asking Abdul Bari, why would MBS be so stupid? It's why I ended my monologue by saying uh, that the, in, in, in famous words from, from the past, from the French minister Talleyrand, when told of the murder of an opponent and the person telling him said it's a terrible crime, he said it's worse than a crime, it's a blunder. And this indeed seems to me a terrible crime, but also a terrible blunder. The helpful troll says the solution with the Saudis is quite simple for the West to solve. Take away the protection from prosecution of state leaders and those in power in the West. Once that happens, and they can be sent to prison for life, they will stop selling arms. Well, <clears throat> you can send state leaders to prison for life, but only if they're Africans. Fra says the price of human rights is obviously 110 million. Well, MBS feels he's above the law, beyond reproach, fated by the West. His arrogance knows no bounds. His follies will catch up with him. A horrendous crime, a gruesome death, reminiscent of the Shank Hill butchers. And Denny says, will our government condemn Saudi actions? Don't hold your breath. All that arms money threatened. Well, Britain has made a lot, not as much as the United States, but a lot of money selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. I don't know if the Prime Minister said anything. The Foreign Minister has said something on one side uh, quite positive, uh, but the other side quite perplexing. And other broadcasters have taken this up today. He said he was horrified by the reports and was seeking an explanation of them. And that's what you would expect the foreign secretary of a country like Britain to do. But he also said that it was very damaging to British-Saudi relations because those relations were built on shared values. And I got to wondering, what exactly are the values that we share with Saudi Arabia? And uh, here is another one from... Chris M. Trump believes a $110 billion arms deal with Saudi is far more important than the life of an American Saudi journalist chopped into pieces for doing something the head choppers causing genocide in Yemen found far more unsavory. That's from Chris M. Good to see your correspondence back on my screen. My dear Chris, I'll be back after the news. I'm by no means an expert on this matter. <clears throat> but as I said earlier, uh, it reminds me of a conversation I had in the 1970s uh, in another era, in another job that I had. One of the leaders of the miners in Scotland was opposing nuclear power. And he said, I'd feel a lot more confident about what you're saying about uh, nuclear power if you didn't have to go into your work done up in a space suit. That was Jim McCafferty, then the leader of the Scottish miners. I don't know if he's still alive, Jim. If you are, I remember you fondly. Uh, but he had a point, 
And ditto uh, the frackers. First of all, who chose that name? Meet the frackers. Well, Lancashire is going to meet them very soon, in the morning, because the High Court gave them a green light today to go ahead. Now, the communicipalist made the point that that's not allowed in Scotland or Wales because, he infers, they have a parliament and an assembly, uh, respectively, that is able to forbid it. But England lacks that. I don't know what the stance of the local authorities was in Lancashire. I don't know what the attitude of the locals is. But perhaps we'll find out some of that. Our guest is Richard Howarth, who's a biodiesel engineer, a bookkeeper and a low-energy home renovator. And, of course, the background to our discussion is that the shale gas company, Quadrilla, will start the first fracking in the UK for seven years tomorrow. A campaign led by Lancashire resident Robert Dennett won an interim injunction last Friday against Lancashire County Council, putting a temporary halt to the start of fracking at a well outside Blackpool. My goodness, a fracking well outside Blackpool. What could possibly go wrong? Richard, are you there? Not yet. Now, of course, the pros of fracking are that it gives access to more gas and oil. Fracking can reach to depths that other extraction methods cannot. It can lower taxes. Petrol for cars as well as gas for cooking will become easier to access. It could produce better air quality. If more people start to use gas, the quality of air will start to improve. And of course, and this is of course related to the last item, it reduces dependency on foreign fuel. Fracking helps countries to explore and exploit their domestic sources. Indeed, Quadrilla's chief executive, Francis Egan, said, and I quote, if commercially recoverable, this will displace costly imported gas with lower emissions, significant economic benefit, and better security of energy supply for the UK. Now, it's all regulated by a traffic light system. Green is for zero magnitude on the Richter scale. Amber, up to 0 0.5. And fracking should only proceed with caution and potentially at a slower rate. Red, 0 0.5 and beyond magnitude or greater. Operations are suspended immediately. I'm talking earthquakes, dear listener. Fracking involves digging and creating earthquakes. And if they're zero on the Richter scale, go ahead, green light. If they're up to 0 0.5, proceed with caution. If they're more than 0 0.5, operations must be suspended. Now, we asked Quadrillion for a quote, but they refused, which is a bit of a mystery. Perhaps they thought I was a green in tooth and claw opponent of them and all their works. If they did think that, they're wrong. I am in a genuinely inquisitive frame of mind. So in the absence of quadrillion, we'll just have to fill the airwaves with anyone who's got a point of view. Whether it's pro-fracking or anti-fracking, let me have your point of view. 0344 499 1000. Now I'm waiting for Richard Howarth to uh, come along. Uh, he's not yet here. But this is, of course, a part of a bigger picture, because in the third hour, we're going to be talking about the UN Climate Change Report. We'll be talking to someone who denies it, Mark Morano. He's executive director of ClimateDepot.com and Communications Director for the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. Now, 97% of scientists agree with the United Nations Climate Change Report. That doesn't mean they're right. 100% of people can be for something and still be wrong. But it does mean it's a very significant body of scientific opinion, which is got to be taken into account. And I'll be trying to do that with Mark Moreno. The headline of the UN climate change report, the one that grabbed me, 
is that the clock is ticking. It's a kind of doomsday clock. And according to the UN, in 12 years, we will begin to suffer irreversible change that may well tip us headlong into disaster. 12 years is a decent amount of time in a man's life, but it's a mere second of time in the life of our children, their children, and their children. So will fracking help or hinder? Is this a contribution to tackling climate change, or will it compound the rapacious process which has brought us climate change in the first place? Good old Richard has shown up early. I'd like to hear now from him. Richard Howarth, tell me first your reaction to the High Court decision today, would you? Ah, good evening. Good evening. Um, yeah, it's... I mean, Quadrilla are years and years behind schedule. Um, they said they would be in this position years ago. Obviously, it's very disappointing that they announced that they are now ready. Um, but local communities said no. They've been protesting against this. Um, huge opposition to it. Um, so it's certainly not the end of the story. What's the attitude of the elected local officials? Uh, I mean, the communities have said no at pretty much every level, everywhere where this industry has tried to establish itself, from parish councils to county councils, declining planning permission, local residents, objections in the thousands. Um, yeah, so at every level, um, people have been opposed to it. Summarise, would you, what the opposition is based on? Yeah, I mean, the, the issues involved with this industry are huge, from uh, water consumption, water contamination, air pollution, huge numbers of vehicle movements required. Because it's such a difficult and technically challenging thing to do, it requires thousands and thousands of wells. It's completely different to conventional onshore drilling, where you can get quite a lot out of just one well. You need thousands to make this industry viable. We're talking about large-scale industrialization of the countryside. Toxic chemicals involved, dangerous working conditions, uh, distraction from renewables. It's not just polluting the air and the water. It's polluting our democracy because companies are going to huge lengths to try and override the local democracy. And, yeah, it's, it's polluting democracy as well as our air and water. Yeah, but, I mean, I mean, nobody wants a nuclear power plant next to them, but everybody uses electricity produced by nuclear power plants. Nobody necessarily wants a slag heap of coal uh, dust uh, in uh, outside their window, but we still use uh, coal-fired power stations. Is this not nimbyism? That's what some people might say, Richard. Um, well, we... You say we still use coal-fired power stations not for much longer because they're generally about to close. Of course, every energy source has impacts. Of course it does. What you need to look at is the relative harms and benefits of, of each form of energy and also reducing the amount of energy that we need in the first place. Um, if you look at um, even the government's own figures on this industry show that renewables are highly popular, getting cheaper in price all the time, uh, right down at the bottom is the most unpopular. Um, you've got nuclear power down the bottom, and right at the bottom, shale gas. It is the least popular form of energy. I accept that. But what about these pros that I read out? If you didn't hear them, I'll run through them quickly. Yeah. This gives access to more gas and oil uh, because fracking can reach depths that other extraction methods can't. It can lower taxes uh, and make uh, gas cheaper. They say the supporters of fracking, that it will improve air quality. You said it will pollute the air quality, but they say if more people start to use gas, the quality of the air will start to remove. And then a point that surely can't be gainsaid, it reduces dependency on foreign fuel. Maybe we'll have to invade fewer countries and occupy them to secure our foreign sources of energy if we recover more of our own. Yeah, so a lot of those arguments are basically saying, well, OK, yeah, there are impacts with gas, 
but it's not quite as awful as coal, which was an absolutely filthy fuel. Um, the yeah, the idea that the air I quite was liked coal myself, by, but go on. Uh, sorry, I quite liked coal myself, but go on. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely revolutioned re- revolution revolutionized our lives and brought a quality of life. But that was, you know, of its time, and its time has now passed. So you think nuclear was a step forward from coal, better than coal? Um, well, there's a whole load of different issues to that. I mean, certainly in terms of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, yes, it's lower, but there are other issues with that, why that's also um, unpopular for many people. But, I mean, the thing, instead of comparing... Uh, fracked gas to coal, we should be comparing it to the other alternatives, such as renewables, and insulating our homes and buildings. Well, uh, of course, uh, I'm not in second place to you on insulation, and that's uh, a must because we would uh, uh, we would markedly reduce the amount of energy that we required if we didn't lose so much of the product of that energy because of poor insulation. But I suppose the point I'm trying to make, and it's my duty to do so as the devil's advocate in this discussion, is that every form of energy production has its pros and cons. I mean, you mentioned renewables, for example. Uh, Wind power, uh, from many people's point of view, is at least as maybe more despoiling of the countryside than the fracking wells will be. Uh, yeah, there's, um, although despite um, a lot of high-profile campaigns against onshore wind, onshore wind is actually really popular with the general public. Um, let's take one particular issue which is of serious concern for many people, which will be the health. There are now hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers published on the impacts of the unconventional gas industry in the States. And it turns out that if you live in a postcode with a lot of unconventional wells, a lot of fracking wells, you are significantly more likely to attend hospital with serious problems related to heart and the nervous system, with problems with urinary systems and skin. Um, Quite shockingly, another paper which looked at, again, uh, thousands and thousands of hospital admissions across the whole state found that if you are pregnant, you are more likely to have complications with your birth and an underweight baby if you live in a postcode with lots of fracking wells. Everywhere this industry has gone, um, the people from industry and uh, politicians have said, don't worry, it will be well regulated, it will be a safe industry. And yet everywhere it's gone, in the States, in Canada, in Australia, um, similar impacts have been shown. It's still going on in all those countries. In fact, uh, America is getting deeper and deeper into it, isn't it? Well, it's an interesting situation in America. Certainly they have produced a lot of gas, but some econo- ec- economists who've studied it, um, those, those wells uh, run out of gas much quicker than conventional wells, and they then have to borrow more money to spend several million pounds to drill the next well. And it turns out a lot of that gas has been produced on borrowed money, and the wells haven't produced enough gas to pay the loans back. So there is the potential that there's actually a huge economic bubble there and the industry is not remotely as profitable as it looks at the first glance. So even the economic case doesn't necessarily stack up. And in this country, we have different geology. Uh, Some very senior academics, uh, geologists, are saying that it shouldn't even be contemplated in this country because we have more fractured geology. Um, Tell me about that. Tell me about these earthquakes. Uh, That's the thing that uh, uh, grabbed me, uh, I must say. I take your point that there have been reports, particularly in the U.S., about water supply uh, uh, being being affected adversely. But the the very act of deliberately creating earthquakes, even small ones, um, kind of shook me up a bit, if you'll forgive the pun. Well, yeah, it's a pretty dramatic impact, isn't it? I mean, you know that this is, you know, it's referred to as unconventional oil and gas extraction or extreme oil and gas extraction. I mean, basically, we've had the low-hanging fruit. We've, um, a lot of the easier-to-access wells have been drilled, and we're now getting to a more extreme uh, level of extraction. So they have huge, uh, they have tens of, 
trucks, each one a huge pump, pumping millions of litres of water three kilometres beneath the ground and then increasing the pressure to vast pressures. And it turns out that these pressures can be so great that they cause tremors and possibly earthquakes. Now, um, there has been a huge increase in earthquakes in the States, but it's thought that some of that is related to wastewater injection because this industry produces millions of litres of toxic waste, possibly slightly radioactive, which they have to dispose of. They've been doing massive water reinjection into old wells, and that's caused some really huge earthquakes. Now, this fracking using water, let's uh, go on to that. Uh, uh, chemicals are only 2% of the pressure. Uh, water, which isn't toxic, is the other 98%. What is per se worrying about pumping water under the ground to release gas? Yeah, so, well, uh, as well as the fact that it can trigger earthquakes and you don't know how long the fractures will, will become, where the water will end up, and actually the concern, um, I would say my biggest concern, isn't that water will get through the rocks up to the surface, it's, it'll get upside the inside of the well casing or through faults in the well casing. Um, but even if you put pure drinking water down the well, about a third, maybe half of that water will come back up the well. And when it comes back up, it will be contaminated because it's been in uh, coal and there's a lot of contaminants, a lot of stuff that doesn't circulate at the surface as part of the natural life cycle. A lot of the toxins get deeper and deeper, and they get brought back up by this process. So the water that comes back up is then toxic, and you've got millions of litres of toxic waste to dispose of. And that's even if you don't put anything toxic down the well. Now, the Environment Agency is supposed to uh, look after uh, our environment. They say quite unequivocally, and I presume the court was guided by this, that there isn't a problem with pollution. Um, uh, uh, what's the allegation that the Environment Agency are incompetent or worse? Well, there's, um, there's, there's multiple issues there. Um, one is that any uh, industry, like you were saying before, any form of energy generation has risks associated with it. You know, a wind turbine might, in a storm, break and a blade might go flying off. But the point, I think, is that the risk of that is low and generally it's accepted that the impacts of that are low. Now, when you're doing something as extreme and technically challenging as drilling a well three kilometres into geology where you don't know what's at the bottom of the well and then subjecting it to huge pressure changes and doing that multiple times, bringing up toxic chemicals, you've got to store those on site. You might, uh, you might have other chemicals such as sulfuric acid on site to, for various processes in the well. These risks are obviously much higher. Um, there are lots of really great people at the Environment Agency trying to do a really good job, but they've been cut to the bone with austerity. Many public services and public institutions have been cut back severely. That, that wouldn't and be a reason for them the saying, I mean, cuts or no cuts, that wouldn't be a reason for uh, people whose life is... Uh, to protect the environment, whose duty it is to protect the environment, to say that fracking was safe if they believed it was unsafe. Yeah, many people at many different levels um, are saying that. Um, people who join the campaign we've had um, here in East Yorkshire, in Hull, where I'm from, um, there was a couple of wells near here, and the range of people was, you know, from the medical profession, nurses and doctors, engineers, um, you know, very se senior engineers. We even had quite a few people who worked in the oil and gas industry uh, stop off at the protest camps and offer their support because they said they'd worked in the States and they'd seen the devastation that this industry had had on communities over there. And they said they didn't want to see that happen to the the English countryside, and, and that's why they were offering their support. That well, um, it is going to happen uh, as early as uh, tomorrow morning. Um, when you said earlier that this is not the end of the story, what did you have in mind? Um, I, the, I mean, the, the level of opposition to this industry has grown and grown, and the more people find out about it, um, 
the more likely they are to tend to be opposed. The government's own statistics um, say that. Um, yeah, people are doing their research and finding out about it. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting. Um, we've just recently seen three protesters, uh, non-violent protesters, been sent to prison um, for, for their actions last week in a dis dis decision that has been described as absurd, absurdly harsh decision. Um, yeah, and, uh, and we found out actually yesterday that it turns out that the judge in that case, his family business is the oil and gas industry. Well, he does it. have uh, family members in the oil and gas uh, industry. Uh, he obviously didn't think that relationship was close enough to require him to recuse himself from the case there has been, I have read the reportage uh, around that um where do the parties stand now you're a green party activist aren't you uh the the green party right, yeah. presumably wholly against this uh, what about the other uh parties uh, are they for banning fracking is is the opposition for example for banning it um, yeah, I guess. I mean, that's questions for them to answer. But basically, um, all the main parties, apart from the Conservatives, uh, are opposed to it. Um, I mean, the Green Party has been opposed to it for, um, for as long as it's been around, really. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good the regulation is. And even if you did have a properly funded bodies to carry out inspections, at the end of the day, it's a fossil fuel. And but then you're, really. you're, I mean, let's be uh, um, frank, Richard, you're against all the uh, forms of producing energy except renewables. So you were against coal, you called it filthy, even though technology existed, even when the mines were being closed uh, to clean the coal and capture the carbon. Uh, you are against nuclear power and you're against fracking. Is that not because you're ideology is um, is one that doubts the value of industrial growth hmm. um, no I mean what I want is uh, a fair and just society where people have uh, comfortable lives I think what people want is homes that are warm and electricity supplies that are reliable uh, and I want that to be done in a way that's just to local communities, that gives those communities a say in how that energy is generated. And it's perfectly possible to do that. It's, it's not easy, and it's certainly not possible to meet current energy demand with renewables. But if we reduce demand, um, various ways... Yeah, but who, how do we reduce, how do we meet reduce the demand? demand? We've, we've already agreed on one of those methods, a proper insulation programme, which... Mm would actually generate tremendous levels of employment and Absolutely, so on in the country. Would, yeah. It's very, very good value for money from the state's point of view. Uh, but, I mean, look at Germany, for example. Uh, Germany now says it has an energy deficit because it stopped nuclear. And Trump is threatening Germany because, he claims, it's now too energy dependent on Russian gas. Isn't the argument here that we need a balanced energy policy. We need to take some from nuclear, some from coal, some from offshore, some from onshore, some from oil, some from gas. Isn't, wouldn't the plain man and woman think that was a more sensible approach? Yeah, I mean, I, I live in Hull. 90% of Hull is a floodplain. The, is, uh, yeah, it's at risk of flooding. In a, you know, in a few decades' time, we could be looking... Uh, that being repeatedly flooded, um, properties becoming worthless, and, yeah, in a few decades' time, we could be looking at having to relocate most of all. That's what we're talking about. Although it seems like... Well, there's a lot of coulds and mights and may uh, in what you've been saying. I've, I've noted that. Your, your statements are frequently studded with could, might, may. Uh, none of these things are certain, are they? OK, uh, let me try and be clear on that then. If we carry on in the way that we're going, which is not on target to reduce carbon emissions, uh, scientists say it is highly likely that sea, sea level will rise several metres, and that means most of Hull will be underwater. OK. 
Uh, Richard, you've been a sport. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for coming on slightly earlier than uh, you expected to. I appreciate that. That's Richard Howarth, Green Party activist, biodiesel engineer, low energy home renovator, talking about the decision in the High Court today to give a green light to a company called Quadrilla. Now, if fracking is an ugly name, Quadrilla, I don't know about you, makes me think Godzilla. We gave them a chance to come on here and to uh, talk to me. We even gave them a chance to give us a quote, but they didn't take up that opportunity either. Let me take a break for some capitalist messages. Fra says, as Turkey is a NATO member, can we expect expulsions of Saudi diplomats from Ankara to Athens, from London to Berlin, from Washington to Warsaw? I think not. Someone will pour Saudi oil over troubled waters. Western hypocrisy will win out again. Well, the way I put it earlier, uh, elsewhere, Fra, was if uh, a Washington Post journalist had been murdered and cut to pieces in a Russian embassy, the Security Council would already be meeting. And if, God forbid, it had happened in an Iranian embassy, we'd already be at war. Let me go to uh, Rick, who says, energy independence is vital for any nation. We are an island nation with the use of tidal lagoons, coast and land wind farms and solar farms. We wouldn't need to indulge in the dangerous process of fracking for energy. It's a dirty, risky way of gaining energy. You can't put the methane or CO2 back in the ground once it's been extracted. Hopefully, under a Labour government, we can heavily invest in renewables and rid ourselves of oil dependence. Great show, says Rick. Great SMS, Rick. Dakota says, listening to Galloway discussing fracking on talk radio, and I couldn't agree more with the discussion that's taking place. Speaking as someone who lives away from home, I see firsthand from the Americans who are abusing fracking in nature and destroying the land. And Jane A. says, fracking investigation work happened a couple of years ago near me in West Newton, Yorkshire. Two minor earthquakes within weeks occurred. Tony X, the protest board, what a brilliant man he is, says the debate around fracking is an example of how global effects of wind power have been ignored. It combines the local effects, earthquakes, water poisoning, etc., with what we know about gas, oil and coal. Where are the studies on wind power abstraction? Good point, Tone. Dean Gilsonan says, if we utilise the many ways of producing electricity introduced to us by people such as Nikola Tesla, then we would have no need for fossil fuels in as much as we'd have no need for the fuel companies. And we can't be having that, can we? Hashtag frack free. John's on the line in Thirsk in North Yorkshire. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, John. Hi, George. Hi. It's a sad day in a sad week. You know, we've had the IPPC report and now we have this result on fracking. How do these two things relate, John? Help me on that. Does Is fracking said to be uh, a contribution against climate change or will it compound, accelerate climate change? Well, the argument in favour of fracking is it's a bridging fuel to renewables. But I don't think it is because once people start to make huge profits... And out- huge investments in it. I mean, yeah. uh, the main thing that struck me when Richard was talking is how extraordinarily complicated and therefore expensive the whole business must be. Yeah, yeah. And the big gas that it produces is methane because that's what natural gas is. And they're constantly flaring the uh, uh, the gas stacks. We have to do that on a regular basis. So any kind of saving from a point of view of CO2 emissions they lose from a point of view of the flaring of, of, of the gas and the methane. And, of course, it's not just the methane that comes out of the stacks. It's all the other um, particulars that they've used in, 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 in the lubricants. It is just, a, you know, it's an incredibly disgusting situation when we're supposed to be trying in the last, in 12 years, and I don't know about you, I don't know how we can turn the economy of the globe around from a point of view of what the IPPC scientists were saying we need to do. Well, t- t- 12 years is a mere second in time, isn't it? It is. It, it, you 
you know, when you, when you think of how long it takes to actually build a small railway line or, or do anything to actually transform society in the way that's necessary, and I think we should give it a go. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I don't think fracking is adding to that giving it a go. In fact, it's going in entirely the wrong direction. And there's a big civil liberties question in relation to this. Those three guys who were arrested were arrested on um, commercial law, which didn't take into account any of the environmental arguments or any of the civil liberties arguments. It's like the Salisbury 2 or the Salisbury 3 in the 70s, the Ricky Tomlinson thing. Uh, Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury. That's the one. That's the one. It's ex- it has the same civil liberties questions as that because people are not going to be allowed to protest. And if they do protest, even in a peaceful way, but they, they trespass... What was, what was the tariff? What, what was the uh, sentence they got? Two years. That's a, a lot of time in prison for, uh, for a demonstration, isn't it? I mean, they might be out in one or whatever, but it's, it, it, it's been used... As, uh, uh, it's presumably it, to discourage the others uh, from what Richard was saying... Uh, protests are unlikely to stop now that the High Court has opined. No, I think it will get bigger. It's a, it is a mass movement, the anti-fracking movement. But I think you had an interesting point where you did ask Richard, although I'm, I, I'm a sympathiser of the Green Party, um, what are we going to do for energy? And, I, and part of my answer, and it's not an answer that a lot of people will be happy with, it, with and I and ask still consider myself to be a socialist, is that we're going to have to get used to having a lot, lot less. If we want humanity to survive on the planet, we have to relocalise the economy, we have to kind of do a lot less in terms of, in, in terms of consumption and lifestyle. It might not sound good, but it's the only option I think we have now. If we want to well, survive. it's a point uh, that uh, Tamar was uh, discussing with me earlier. Um, given the cycle of democracy, the constant need to be elected, re-elected, um, in Western democracies, no one's going to take the big long-term decisions, such as the one you imply, uh, that actually we're going to have to decide that we don't want to get richer and richer, even though, in fact, over the the last decade, we've been getting poorer and poorer. Exactly. But look at the vote for for Green parties throughout Europe and across the world, in fact. It's negligible, really, in any meaningful sense, um, because people do not want to have, I I, I would say, a better lifestyle, but a lot of people would say a poorer lifestyle. Yeah, well, uh, good luck uh, going on the doorstep selling that, uh, John. But uh, it's a fair point, of course, that you make. Let me take a break for some messages. David Leviscont on Twitter says, The problem with fracking, GG, is contamination of our water. All the chemicals they use seep into the water table. Who is going to foot the bill for the cleanup when things go wrong? If indeed it's even possible to clean up, take Fukushima as an example. And John says, in reality, big business, it's cheaper to produce new plastic than to recycle. Uh, of course, Fukushima was a nuclear uh, a plant uh, disaster, not, not fracking. Uh, Mal in Belfast says, sometimes I don't get it. In the past, we've rallied against the devastation of communities when coal production was being destroyed. There are many places above ground that have now started to cave into sinkholes around the country as effect of that production. Will fracking be any different? Was it right to have stopped our coal production when we look at it now? Mal, I may be the last man standing, but I believe that we had a thousand years of coal under our own feet and in public ownership. We had the technology for clean coal, and carbon capture. We made a criminal blunder, destroying, flooding forever our own coal mines. And I believe that we need a balanced energy policy. I will go to my grave believing that coal was a legitimate part of that balanced energy policy. For uh, the sake of full disclosure, 
I am an honorary member of the National Union of Mine Workers. Neil Salter says fracking opens up more extraction of carbon from the ground. But for us all to stand a chance of controlling climate breakdown, we have to keep most fossil fuels in the ground and use alternatives. Renewables or thorium-based nuclear could save us. The helpful troll says, The solution with the Saudis is quite simple for the West to solve. I've read that one, actually, forgive me. Fra says, The price of human rights is obviously $110 million. Read that one too. John and Lank says, With the Tory government supporting fracking, will only boost climate change. Also, fracking helps the fuel plastic industry by producing ethylene, a byproduct, to produce more plastic. Tony says, I'm on the edge of my seat waiting for the climate change discussion. I have a hypothesis that wind turbines do more to change the weather than coal, oil and gas ever could because they abstract energy from one of the primary global weather drivers. Fascinating. Well, when Tony says something, I sit up and listen. Don't know about you. Let's hear from Phil in Sheffield. Go ahead, Phil. Hi. Hi there. Uh, first of all, that your programme. Thank you, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to Sheffield, to the Montgomery next month. Come along and see oh, me. Oh, brilliant. I'll try and get tickets. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, fucking. Yeah. Um, there's been so much talk, and it's all been sort of polit- politically lined. Um, what I've got to say has got nothing to do with politics at all. Um, I believe that the gas, oil and water inside the earth act as a cushion. In other words, if there's an earthquake in Australia, it gets buffered and buffered, gas, water, etc. And it can't go any further than, you know, it can't reach Britain, let's put it that way. Um, We've already taken virtually one third of of um, this resource out, and that is oil. And we're taking gas. Um, we've obviously taken water, but I believe once that buffer is extinct, non-existent, then it will cause earthquakes. Well, of course, earthquakes have always taken place in the world. They take place in countries where there's no fracking. Uh, earthquakes are a natural phenomenon. It doesn't seem immediately attractive to me to be deliberately creating new ones. I'll grant you that. Um, the, the, I told it. you earlier, the, the the worst thing about fracking that I can see is that it requires you to deliberately create earthquakes, however small. Uh, that seems uh, unnecessarily risky for me unless you had no alternatives. Well, I, per- I personally don't believe it causes earthquakes as such, per se. But what I do believe is it exaggerates the effect of an earthquake. In other words, an earthquake in Australia will reach India with or without, with the oil, etc., gas in the ground. You're saying without because this oil, cushion has been air, uh, taken out. It'll, yeah. reach, it'll reach Britain. So it, it will exaggerate. Uh, there is no buffer. Uh, once there's no buffer, um, you remember the old executive toys of the 60s, 70s, the five or six boards on a string? Yes, yes. And you press the one and the end wouldn't... Well, if you put water in between that, a little bag of plastic water in between the second and third ball, a little bag of oil between the fourth and the fifth, and a little bag of um, gas, then try it. And that fifth ball would never move. It would never move. Interesting, interesting. Hmm? Phil, maybe we'll talk about it at the Montgomery next month. I hope you come along. Mal says, the truth of Trump is in the money from Saudi Arabia. And who knows what self-interest he has in his own personal dealings. Trump detests the media when they call him out and says they are the enemies of the people. He will do nothing to the Saudis. Also, bringing in the mentally ill Kanye West to waffle for 10 minutes in an off-the-scale monologue yesterday, blowing smoke uh, up his fundament whilst Florida was left devastated by a hurricane, was just trying to get 
a black vote on side. Well, there's no reason for saying that Kanye West is mentally ill. I doubt if he's any more mentally ill than any other uh, rock star in his firmament. Um, it was uh, uncomfortable, the monologue, I'll grant you. But I think I'd rather listen to Kanye West for 10 minutes than Donald Trump, wouldn't you? Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, he's got a new name. He's Ye West. <laughs> the artist formerly known as Kanye. Uh, Councillor James Ball says, read the House of Saud, Trump, May and Macron. What we sow, so shall we reap. And Mary says, to be honest, George, I'm very confused. Why now are these businesses like Virgin cutting ties with the Saudis and the news suddenly interested? Why didn't they do this after the school children were killed on a bus or Yemen in tatters? Let's hear from Dion in Slough. Go ahead, Dion. Yeah, good evening, George. Evening, sir. Yeah, I was listening about the fracking and I was saying you produced. So I think Eamon Holmes is going to be at me. He's always on about he wants it, and so do I. It's Eamon's a big fracking man, is he? No, I think it's, we've got a natural resource. We've got to tap into it. You know, I mean, well, I was like, yeah, but I mean, there's costs and benefits, isn't there? Uh, um, there's a benefit, no doubt, uh, in finding sources of uh, domestic energy. But what if the cost of it is too great to make it worthwhile? And the cost of it is not just money. It's uh, yeah, environmental depredation, that. safety of water supply, safety of the geology of the country and so on. Um, I don't know. It's I've listened to a couple of callers, the guests you had on there, and I agree I mean, with you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't set fire to your own furniture to keep warm, would you? Just because you had it, it, it was yours, so let's burn it. Uh, because it the, the, the cost of that would be far greater than the benefit. Yeah, but at the time, you don't want to freeze to death, so you can always replace the furniture. Mm, not sure or that's the perfect answer, Dion. Yeah, I know, but it's... You know, it's there. I mean, when they first started, they said they'll leave it as it was before. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. What if they go out of business, though? I mean, that's one of the issues here. I mean, uh, one of our uh, tweeters uh, says that the fracking business is a Ponzi scheme. I think it was Lizzie, the lovely legend. Lizzie said it's a Ponzi scheme. What, what if uh, they're no longer around to put things back the way they were? Well, who, then, who, as usual, who pays, the who pays for that then? Well, as usual, the government will bail it out, same as they did with the banks and everything. Doesn't like, doesn't sound a great deal, uh, that, to me, no, Dion. But it is. <laughs> anyway, you're quite fatalistic. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, do it. It's the same I'm a member of Back Heathrow, and that's been going on for too long. We've got to go ahead, because I live near Heathrow Airport, live in Langley, and the amount of employment Heathrow <laughs> housing just in my area, not just working at the airport, but all the backlash of it as well. You know, the shops, transport, everything. You know, people to maintain the place. Well, pragmatic, yeah. Dion. Uh, thanks for that very pragmatic uh, call. Let me get through some more of the paperwork. Mal again. Furthermore, it isn't funny. Uh, no, I've done that one. Uh, Andrew, Saudi Arabia is so powerful it has the power to bring down the petrodollar and thence the Federal Reserve. So hats off to the fearless talk radio. That's us. Lizzie says, yes, George Galloway, the Natural History Museum, did take a lot of money to turn the other cheek. As real Donald Trump said, America would likely not investigate because of the money. And Mal says, as Trump was meeting an off-the-scale Ye West Parts of Florida were levelled by a hurricane and Trump was selling $120 billion worth of weaponry to the Saudis to kill people. Somebody pointed out, I'm, I'm saying it now because I haven't yet come to it and it's not on my screen. It is a bit ironic that the Saudi Arabians would hire a hall in the Natural History Museum when it's entirely illegal to admit the possibility of evolution in Saudi Arabia, and dinosaurs couldn't possibly have been 
because the earth hasn't been around for 500 million years, according to the Saudis. Well, the second hour has flown by, and I didn't quite expect it to. We will be, of course, continuing to discuss fracking, as well as the Saudi story, the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul, which most sensible people are now convinced did indeed happen. And in the third hour, as I say, we'll be talking to a climate change denier, Mark Morano, and also Bob Ward, the Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Institute on Climate Change and Environment, giving the alternative uh, point of view. Now, is climate change happening? Without a shadow of a doubt. Anyone who lived through Britain this summer knows that summers ain't what they used to be. They're longer and they're baking hot. In fact, even this week, it's been unseasonably hot in England. And if you look at the heat map of the world, you'll see that the highest temperatures ever recorded, the one this year was in Algiers, I think, just across the Mediterranean from the European continent, the highest temperature ever, ever recorded. Huge icebergs are breaking off and drifting. Water levels are rising. It is no longer feasible to claim that climate change is some kind of myth. It's therefore absurd for it to be denied. There's an argument about the extent to which human activity has accelerated it. There's an argument to be had about how to reverse it. But if, as the United Nations say this very week, that in only 12 years, a mere second in historical time, we will have passed a point of no return, the irreversible climate change will have occurred to the grave detriment of the environment of the earth. That's got to be big news. That's got to be something that we all take seriously. So we'll have a debate on that coming up in the rest of this hour. Not, of course, abandoning the subject that we opened with, the murder most foul in Istanbul. And we've got a caller on that, Omar in Birmingham. Welcome, Omar. Hello, George. Hello, sir. Hello, um, hello, legend. I'm, I'm, I love you, George. I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, but I'm originally from the Middle East. I'm calling uh, to disagree with you t- t- tonight, if you don't mind. Go ahead. I, I welcome disagreement. <laughs> I welcome it. <laughs> I really I like you very much, George. But I don't... Uh, I really... I, I'm, uh, I watch a lot of uh, Arabic news and... And, and even uh, BBC and all the news. and But the thing is, I really I don't believe uh, in, in Saudi behind either. Not Saudi, and I don't believe even the Turkey even done it. I, th- I believe there's a third party. I really believe that. Uh, you believe what? I don't believe Saudi behind it. Uh, if they, if, uh, or a third like, party. So neither Saudi yeah. Arabia nor Turkey. Absolutely, I really believe that because there's nothing beneficial to Saudi Arabia or, or even to Turkey, George. So I believe there's a, there's a well. It was. Part. I mean, if if it was Saudi Arabia, and uh, Turkey is not in any doubt that it was, and yeah. neither is the U.S. They're the two countries most directly involved because yeah. Khashoggi was living there and working there, yeah. uh, not just for any newspaper but for the Washington Post, and it happened in Turkey. Uh, so neither of those two countries are in any doubt. But I did concede this point earlier uh, yeah. that it, it was stupidity on a quite astronomic scale <laughs> if, if, if the Saudi regime did this. But then absolutely, they, absolutely. They, they have done many such things in yeah, the past. But the, thing is, but the thing is, George, now Istanbul is, is like a Wild Wild West. You can kill anyone in Istanbul, in the street of Istanbul. You but, can hide but, a hitman and you can kill anyone in the street of Istanbul. 
Well, well that, that's, that's true. Kids, that's kids true. Uh, uh, that's true. I'm, again, I made that point earlier that, yeah. uh, you know, this is not uh, good versus evil, God before the yeah, devil and all yeah, that, because yeah, yeah. Uh, Turkey has a very checkered history itself. Exactly, and these are exactly. facts. You don't have to yeah. take my word for them. But yeah. here's the unfortunate problem for you, Omar. Yeah. The footage of him going into the consulate is yeah. clear, visible for everyone to see. Turkey and the United States say they have now seen video, presumably yeah. from illicit cameras uh, planted yeah. by Turkey in the Saudi embassy, uh, that show him being tortured and murdered. And both America and Turkey say they've heard uh, the audio, partly from his Apple uh, watch, uh, of him being tortured. So there's not many people, bar you, uh, who don't think he was killed in the Saudi embassy. <laughs> But the thing is, George, there's nothing we didn't hear. I, I'm, I'm watching now the news, even the Turkish and, and, and China news in Arabic. There's, there's nothing official from Turkish. There's only propaganda. Well, the, it's, I, I didn't, uh, didn't it's true that Erdogan, Erdogan is uh, following a drip, drip. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, and exactly, he's, yeah. he's preferring to release most news through the exactly. Washington Post. Exactly, yeah. And he's wow. pleased the Americans today by the release of the pastor. So he obviously exactly. sees this as uh, as uh, an incident, Bargain. as yeah. an incident to improve his relations with the U.S. that have been going off the boil. Exactly. But as we say in Scotland, Omar, facts yeah. are chills that win a ding. Facts can't be changed. Uh, well, he he well, was killed. He was killed in the consulate. Uh, there's uh, no sane or rational argument that he was killed anywhere other than in the consulate. And therefore, how did a third party get into the consulate to kill him? Well, in, in Istanbul, uh, how many uh, journalists for the last this year have been killed in, in the street in, in, in Istanbul? There's a plenty, there's a Syrian... Well, that, that's woman. also true, but their bodies are usually found. Uh, what, what? In this case, the body appears to have been taken out in cake boxes. We will know this coming days, we will know. But I really, I don't think the Saudi are that kind of stupid. They're killing someone inside the uh, Saudi council. I really, I, I, I cannot see it. I, well, I, I, I understand your, uh, your incredulity about that. Yeah. I share it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't mean that they didn't do it because they have a long history of kidnapping people. Uh, uh, Hariri is the obvious uh, recent example. Uh, well, the Prime Minister, to, the Prime Minister of Lebanon. MSI from MSX, haven't? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, anyone, anyone, uh, the kidnapping even happened in Western countries, no. So. Well, that's uh, certainly true. <laughs> the United uh, States MSI kidnapped somebody in, in Italy in the war yeah. on terror. Omar, yeah. it's been a pleasure disagreeing with you. I'm grateful for your call. More grateful than you can imagine. Chris M says, until there's further evidence that fracking is more detrimental than imported natural resources, including the balanced view of nuclear energy, we have to proceed with caution with fracking. And Marie McFarlane says, fracking is not banned in Scotland. Pipelines have been dug throughout cleared woodland behind me and Grangemouth. Scottish Labour won the outright ban motion by one vote this year, the Scottish government, the SNP, abstained. No mention from Sturgeon. That's an interesting correction, uh, and I'm grateful to you, Marie, for that. Let's take a break. Now, the United Nations, in its climate change report, has rung a bell, at least with most people in the world, that doomsday could be approaching. By doomsday, I mean a tipping point uh, where irreversible climate change will have occurred and that to the detriment of the environment and for the future of the planet and that which lives on it. Not everyone, of course, accepts the UN climate change report. One such is Mark Morano. He's executive director of ClimateDepot.com, communications director for the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, and has recently writ written a book on the subject. And I'm particularly grateful that he joins me from Virginia in the United States right now. Mark, welcome to the show. 
Thank you, George. Happy to be here today. Now, um, summarize, if you would, uh, your position and your critique of the United Nations report this week. Well, I think what's happened here is the United Nations is, su- is, su- is such trying to lobby so hard for further climate action, in quotes, that they're just getting more and more shrill, less and less scientific, and they're coming up with scarier and scarier predictions of the future in order to make the world act. Now, the United Nations Climate Panel was formed in 1988, and it's in charge of finding how much carbon dioxide controls the weather and is causing a climate catastrophe. If it fails to find that carbon dioxide is a danger to the planet, then it has no reason to exist. But when it finds carbon dioxide is a danger, it also puts itself in charge of the solution. So it's essentially a lobbying organization that's self-interested, trying to essentially enrich its own power uh, by issuing these reports. And this latest report, by coming up with yet another tipping point, is literally being, to the extent that anyone's paying attention to it in Washington, by our administration and the Republicans in charge of Congress and the Senate, they're laughing at it. They're mocking it and ridiculing it when they're not completely ignoring it. And that is as it should be. This report was written by 91 U.N. scientists who are activists. One of them was Michael Oppenheimer. This is a guy who worked for the Environmental Defense Fund. He took a quarter million dollars from Barbara Streisand, the Hollywood actress. He spent decades just being an environmental activist. This is not written by neutral scientists. This is a report that deserves to be ignored. But you wouldn't dispute that the vast majority of scientists agree with it. Okay. In my book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, which lays out the climate skeptics' case, the idea that the vast majority, and more specifically 97% of scientists support this, does not hold up at all. In fact, the surveys, I interviewed a UN lead author, Dr. Richard Toll, who said that the 97% claim was, quote, pulled from thin air, and that one of the claims was even seven, wasn't even 97 scientists. It was 77 anonymous scientists. So what happens is, is you get the situation where, yes, the U.N. scientists all agree. The U.N. handpicks these scientists or they self-select themselves to go to the U.N., but not at all. In fact, Donald Trump was quoted as saying he can show you reports that show the climate is fabulous and that uh, he's suspect of the people who wrote this U.N. report. He's right on both counts. The peer-reviewed literature shows that not only are hurricanes, floods, droughts, tornadoes not increasing, they're actually either stable or declining on climate time scales. The global temperatures aren't normally unusual, but what happens is... The what was that in Florida this week, then? Uh, it, was a, it was called a hurricane, and it was uh, on, after a 12-year drought of hurricanes where no major category, three or larger hurricane, had made landfall. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure I saw a hurricane uh, less than 12 years ago. Mark, um, you Thanks mentioned laughing. Can I assure you that most of my yeah, audience are laughing at the idea that we should take Donald Trump's view on such a complex scientific matter? I mean, this is a guy who can barely uh, chew gum and walk straight at the same time. Right. You don't. Have, I mean, I'm mentioning Donald Trump because he's in power here in Washington. You don't have to like Donald Trump. Uh, a guy named Freeman Dyson, who's considered Einstein's successor at Princeton University, has recently come out and said that the Democratic Party and the other, uh, is completely wrong on climate and that the Republicans have it right. Major scientists – in my book, it's endorsed by a Nobel Prize-winning scientist, Dr. Ivar Dever. And I go through all the scientists who dissented. I have a whole section on U.N. scientists who turned against the United Nations because of its alarmism. Let's remember, this U.N. report was headed by a man named Regenda Pachari, the climate panel, who literally said global warming is my religion. That's who headed it. He said they were at the beck and call of governments. This is a government report for governments that has gotten science and bastardized it. So if your audience is skeptical of climate skeptics, they ought to take a minute to research the United Nations and these absurd claims that they're making. And it's all about changing the world. And the, the former climate chief of the UN, Christina Figueres, has said, we seek a centralized transformation. That's a direct quote from her, and I have that in the book, that, uh, to, in order to make people's lives very different in order to fight climate change. We've gotten to a point where the U.N. is essentially advocating central planning in order to alter the weather and storms. We have a U.S. senator in Washington now, Chuck Schumer, implying that if we had done more climate legislation and taxes, we would have less frequent hurricanes. 
this is hearkening back to medieval witchcraft. I hope your audience spends a moment and starts researching this topic. Now, you know, the the two scientists that you pray and aid now are definitely more credible than, than Donald Trump uh, and uh, have, uh, have perked up a bit of interest, I'm sure, amongst the audience, as is your point that this is a kind of lobbying exercise. But there's plenty of lobbying going on on the other side, isn't there? Uh, forgive me, I don't know about climatedepot.com or Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. Are they funded by anyone? Well, my critics would say, oh, he's a fossil fuel lobbyist. I'm not a lobbyist, never have been. Uh, 85% of our funding comes from individual donations. And here's the thing. If we would love to get fossil fuel money, ExxonMobil just came out supporting a carbon tax. We oppose a carbon tax. I completely oppose it. They wouldn't give me money. They've given Stanford University $100 million in order to study global warming and to promote global warming alarmism. The big fossil fuel companies like the idea of a regulated economy because they're big corporations that can handle all these regulations. So they give to money and they give to green groups in order to appear green. The fracking industry gave the Sierra Club almost $30 million in order to fight coal. The Sierra Club had a policy of not accepting fossil fuel money. They got in a lot of trouble when that came out. You know, our organizations, you know, skeptical organizations, don't even compare to the kind of money that fossil fuel gives to green groups. So that argument doesn't, doesn't hold up. But you have to look at who the U.N. is and what the state of the climate is. And in the book, I lay out the case, the politically incorrect guide to climate change, literally lays out the case. All of this we've heard before. The U.N. issued a tipping point on climate, 1989, 10 years. Guess what? It expired. Al Gore issued a 10-year tipping point in 2006. Guess what? It expired. Prince Charles issued a 100-month tipping point. It expired. What do they all do? They just make new tipping points into the future. It's laughable. And that's the whole focus of this. That's why no one in Washington is paying attention to this report other than the minority party slash the Democrats. No, uh, you're not denying. I mean, you use the word to, uh, to describe yourself as a skeptic. A skeptic is one thing, a yeah. denier is another. You're not denying that there is global warming, are you? No, that's a very interesting question you asked, there, George, because if you go back to the Ro- and I spend a whole chapter in my book on this, if you go back to the Roman warming period around the time of zero A.D., we have cooled since then, and I show all the paleoclimate peer-reviewed studies that show that the Earth was warmer back then. If you go to the medieval warm period, it was as warm or warmer from about 900 to 1300. So if you say, are we warming? Well, not since the Roman warming period, likely not since the medieval warming period, but since the modern ther- uh, thermometer beatings went on, about 1850, late 19th century, yes, we've warmed. We were in a little ice age back then. We had uh, the, the, the Thames River frozen over, New York Harbor frozen over. That was a very cold period. So the advent of modern thermometers did coincide with a big global warming period. But 80 percent of man-made carbon dioxide came after World War II in 1945. So you can't blame the 19th century warm-up and the early part of the century warm-up when Greenland and the Arctic are all these. And I detail all the alarming stories. The Arctic's about to melt away. Greenland ice is going to be a catastrophe. Antarctic ice is melting. It all goes in cycles. And I show all of that. So... You can't say, is it warming? Yes, we've warmed since the Little Ice Age. Another trick is since the 1970s. You'll see a lot of uh, climate activists say, since 1970, we've warmed. What was happening in the 1970s? The global cooling scare. And I go through and I show the CIA, NASA, major figures, scientific figures, warning of a coming ice age and global cooling back then. And then they switched in the 1980s and started warming, a warning of man-made global warming. Surely there's a correlation between the Industrial Revolution uh, from from the late 18th century and 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 onwards, uh, and that's surely buttressed by the fact that as parts of the world that were previously not industrialized, like China, like India, have become industrialized, that this has added to the problem. Okay, but mankind's activities can both have a cooling and a warming influence. They can have a cooling influence. If you go back to the 1970s, they were saying our aerosol emissions from carbon, carbon dioxide, from uh, carbon-based fuels, fossil fuels, were causing global dimming, which was going to block out the sun and cause the temperature to drop. That was one of the hallmarks. So before fossil fuels caused global warming, fossil fuels caused global warming. Then they said, well, that didn't matter because CO2 was such a warming gas. It was going to overwhelm it and become the central control knob of the climate. 
what I point out in the book, and I interview geologists, University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League universities, MIT, Harvard, and I show that carbon dioxide is but one of hundreds of factors that influence the climate. It is not the control knob of the climate, and that's the key thing. So, yes, CO2 can have a warming effect, but we can't distinguish it from natural variability and have not been able to do so. What happened to the polar bears, George? They're no longer an icon. Al Gore didn't mention them in his new book, didn't mention them in his sequel to An Inconvenient Truth. They don't mention them because polar bears are at or near historic population highs, and that's one of the things we're finding is they just – cherry pick whatever they want they come out with all this but the key is that nature rules the climate and that's what i try to show in this and if you get away from the united nations if you get away from a few activists professors and scientists at universities promoting this you'll see that there's a whole body of evidence out there not only peer-reviewed studies but scientists and sadly many of them now are retired because they weren't able to speak out when they worked i um Joanne Simpson was the first woman Ph.D. meteorologist in America. She worked for NASA. It wasn't until she was in her late 70s and nearly 80 years old that she came out and said, now that I'm no longer working for NASA, I can say I'm a skeptic of global warming. What about the the report? Uh, uh, There's a prediction in the report of uh, a tremendous uh, number of extinct animals, extinction uh, that will be, uh, that are foreseeable. You you think all of that is hooey? No, okay, first of all, you said a prediction. What, what happens is the United Nations will say many bad things will happen due to global warming. And any time a bad thing happens, like you mentioned a hurricane, oh, my gosh, a hurricane, we warned you of bad things. They, we told you there'd be storms. We have senators that say there's a hurricane in, tor- a tornado in, in Tornado Alley in Oklahoma. This is what we were warned about. What, that there would be a tornado when we've all, when, even though we're at record low number of tornadoes the last five or six but years? The intensity of them alley. is, uh, is uh, more serious, isn't it? Like no, like the heat a, waves. Yeah, no, I mean we've been we've got a warming trend. You're going to have more heat waves, and yes, we've warmed over the last since the end of the 19th century, and we've warmed since the 1970s in particular. You could argue whether we've warmed since say the 1930s. The EPA has the charts that show that U.S. cities had the hottest uh, record number of heat wave days, record breaking days in the 1930s, and those still reign supreme in the chart. But however, the key here is this: the United Nations. And not only activists, but they've got – you mentioned it with about species, the predictions. When, when current reality fails to alarm, what they do is called a misdirection. They start making all these scary predictions about the future. So what they've come out with now is the 1.5 degree or 2 degree Celsius target. In my book, I show that the ClimateGate emails that were released in 2009 – Top U.N. scientists actually saying, where did this number come from? It was quite literally pulled from thin air, this two-degree Celsius number. They came out with a political number. They admit it's political, and they're trying to change society. They're trying to lobby governments for regulations and taxes with the implication that regulations and taxes will control the weather. And that is where I say medieval witchcraft. I have a whole chapter on the history of witchcraft and how witches were accused of changing the weather, and now they're accusing us of our cars and, and home heating and air conditioning of changing the weather. It's, What's the name of your really, book, Mark? I'm going to get it now. Okay, it's called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change. It's an Amazon.com number one bestseller, climatology, earth science. You can get it on Amazon. You can go to climatedepot.com, Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change. I lay out the case. I believe it's uh, over 400 pages. It's one of the longest guidebooks they've written on this, of the Politically Incorrect Guide. Okay, I'll get it. I might put a brown paper wrapping around it. I'm not sure uh, it would be wise of me to uh, walk around showing off your book. But thanks, Mark, for a very interesting discussion. That's Mark Morano uh, of ClimateDepot.com. A contrary point of view will be along shortly. But I told you earlier that Quadrilla had declined to give us a comment, as indeed uh, they did decline. But there is a statement by Quadrilla out there, and uh, it's been thought that it's wise for me to read it out. Hydraulic fracturing to go ahead at shale gas exploration site in Lancashire. Quadrilla confirms that it plans to go ahead tomorrow, 13th October, with the start of hydraulic fracturing operations at its Preston New Road shale gas exploration site in Lancashire. At the High Court in London today, 12th October, Mr Justice Supperstone dismissed a last-minute request for an interim injunction 
to prevent this from happening, and also dismissed a judicial review case against Lancashire County Council's emergency response planning and procedures for the Preston New Road site. Mr Justice Supperstone concluded that there was no evidence to support the contention that LCC had breached any of the relevant duties concerning emergency planning. Francis Egan, Chief Executive Officer of Quadrilla, said, and I quote, We are delighted to be starting our hydraulic fracturing operations as planned. We are now commencing the final operational phase to evaluate the commercial potential for a new source of indigenous natural gas in Lancashire. If commercially recoverable, this will displace costly imported gas with lower emissions, significant economic benefit and better security of energy supply for the UK. The hydraulic fracturing process will take approximately three months to complete for both horizontal exploration wells. Quadrilla will then test the flow of natural gas from those two wells with initial results expected in the new year. Tony X, the protest board, says this guy is laying out some truths. The industry around climate change is phenomenally well-funded. It's an industry populated by people who care for their current lifestyle. Nothing more. Let's hear from Bob Ward. He's the Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Institute on Climate Change and Environment. He's a member of the advisory group to the High Level Leadership Forum on Carbon Pricing and Competitiveness. He's Deputy Chair of the London Climate Change Partnership and he's Policy and Communications Director for the Centre for Climate Change, Economics and Policy. Bob, you'll have a different point of view to our previous guest. Kindly summarise it for us, would you? Yeah, well, uh, he's been around a long time and uh, every time he comes on, he seems to get more and more shouty. So almost nothing he told you is true. So let's go through some of the points he made. So let's start with the way in which he kept talking about UN scientists. That's not true. All of the scientists who were involved in this report were um, essentially members of staff at universities um, at the, uh, around the world. I, I'm a member of staff at London School of Economics, and they are not. They weren't paid for doing this report. They're paid by their universities. They were commissioned by the government. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are the world's governments, and they asked scientists to come up with this independent report. And then the government sat down last week and went through it line by line, including the Trump administration, the State, Fish, State Department officials went through it line by line, and they approved it. And so Mark forgot to mention that the U.S. government approved the report that he's been, he was ranting and raving about. And well, that was a serious omission, definitely. Yes, he didn't quite didn't quite get round to that. But of course, Mark is um, Mark is a a stout and outspoken Republican. If you go and look at the Twitter feed for ClimateDepot.com, you'll see that this week he's been commenting on Kanye West and Donald Trump's meeting. Last week he was talking about how wonderful it was that Kavanaugh had been endorsed uh, to be set on the Supreme Court. So, and you shouldn't be surprised by that. He used to This be, is not necessarily you know, a right-wing, left-wing issue, though, Bob. Uh, um, Piers Corbyn, for example, is also a climate change sceptic, and I assure you, he's lefter than Lenin. He certainly is, although he is a big fan of uh, Donald Trump. But the, the point is that neither P Piers Corbyn is not a climate scientist, not, uh, neither is Mark Morano. The, if you want to, if you want a reliable and credible view on the science of climate change, and you don't want to accept the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, then I suggest you go and look at the websites of the National Science Academies, so such as the Royal Society in the UK. Now, that's all of the scientists. It's not just the climate scientists. It's the scientists, the best scientists from across all disciplines, and you'll find not a single. National Science Academy in the world agrees with Mark Morano on this because they have looked at the evidence and it is very clear. It is unequivocal that the world is warming. 
it's warming across the world. In the UK, on eight warmest years on record of all occurred from the year 2000 onwards. Heat waves. I can getting... feel that myself. I mean, uh, I've lived uh, a decent amount of time in this country, uh, 64 years to be precise, and um, it's obvious uh, to me as the nose on my face that it's getting warmer in Britain. But that's right. Farmers and gardeners can see this. They can see that not only are the seasons arriving early, spring is arriving early, they can see that wildlife is changing because they're responding. So when Mark Morano implies there's some sort of conspiracy, well, he's going to have to enlist all of the world's species as well because they're all responding to this warming. And you can't explain the warming by any other, <laughs> any other way than the fact that carbon dioxide levels are rising in the atmosphere. They are unequivocally they're more than 40% higher than they were before the Industrial Revolution. You can measure their source because they have a particular chemical signature, and we know it's from the burning of fossil fuels. And we've known for at least 150 years that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and when you increase levels, it increases warming. So none of that, he can't refute any of that. So... His argument, and I have to come back to you, examining when you asked him where his funding came from, I noticed he didn't... He was economical it. with the actuality about exactly. that. Exactly. He just said that Exxon Mobil <laughs> didn't fund him. But the fact is, he keeps secret the sources of his funding. Now, I'm afraid that Mark is playing the same role as lobby groups used to play back in the day when the tobacco industry was funding a misinformation ca campaign about the link between smoking and lung cancer. And Mark's job is to dispute the science so that people don't start talking about policy, that he wants to stall it in the same way as there was a big lobby group that tried to create confusion about the science of the link between smoking and um, cancer in order to stop a discussion about regulation of cigarettes. Unfortunately, this is dangerous and it's costing people's lives. Let's take Britain. We, the heat waves are becoming more frequent and more intense. And this summer, during our heat wave, hundreds of people died. Most of them were people who had underlying illnesses, lung uh, illnesses, but hundreds of people died. So every time Mark comes on and tries to create confusion and delay and stop regulation, these are the consequences. He's, it's happening in the United States as well. He tried to imply that the, there's been no change in extreme weather. But the fact of the matter is that Hurricane, Hurricane Michael, which has just devastated um, uh, parts of Florida, the storm surge associated with that, which wiped out many of the properties on the coastline, was more severe because of sea level rise. And the sea level rise is because of warming. And the fact that it intensified so quickly and caught many people by surprise was because the waters in the Gulf of Mexico are unusually warm. And they're unusually warm because of global warming. So he's causing harm to the people of the United States as well. And the reason he's doing it is because he subscribes to a point of view held by an extreme part of the Republican Party that just simply doesn't agree with any kind of regulation of business, particularly the fossil fuel industry. And there's nothing more sophisticated uh, to his argument than that. What so about, let me ask you, uh, Bob, um, what about the argument that the... Uh, the lobby, as he would call it, the movement of scientists and activists, as I would call it, uh, is guilty of crying wolf, uh, that uh, that tipping points have been declared and have turned out not to be tipping points. And therefore, why should we believe this 12-year tipping point? Well, the 12-year the tipping point refers to policy. And, and what we know about carbon dioxide is that it stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. So the consequence, of, this is the reason why the concentrations are going to go up as long as we keep emitting, and they will go up and there's a lag in the system. So the climate responds slowly to the rising concentrations. And even if we stopped all emissions tomorrow, 
the climate will continue to adjust for the next few decades. And what the scientists have done is they've extrapolated forward from current rates of emissions and said if we do not halve by 2030 and then get them down to zero by 2050, we will experience warming of more than one and a half degrees as an average. Now, let me just put that into context because one and a half degrees doesn't seem much compared to daily fluctuations in temperature, but we're talking about the global average temperature. And the global average temperature is very sensitive, creates very sensitive uh, climatic conditions. The difference between today's temperature and the temperature when the last ice age is only five degrees. So one and a half degrees might not seem much, but what the scientists have said is that it will have very grave consequences. And of course, there are uncertainties about this because we're going into territory that we have no historical experience of. Our, our concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the moment are higher than they've been for millions of years. So you can't rely on historical experience. You're trying to look at the geological record. And what that shows is that we are moving where sea level is going to continue to rise. And there are big dangers, particularly in Greenland and West Antarctica, where we have massive land-based ice sheets, which between them hold enough ice to raise global sea levels by 13 meters. Now, they're not going to melt overnight, but they are becoming unstable. And particularly in West Antarctica, there is evidence that the ice shelves around the outside of the ice sheet, which formed over millions of years during the last ice age, have started to disintegrate and that the ice on the land inside is now sliding into the ocean and that may now be an unstoppable and irreversible process which commits us over the coming centuries to several meters of sea level rise so the problem we have with climate change and one that's most difficult to get across is that the decisions we're making now will have long-lived consequences and it's not just about the risks that we face it's the risks that our children, our grandchildren, yes, quite, and yeah. generations will face. Now, uh, very briefly, Bob, if I may ask you to be, uh, where does fracking uh, fit in in all of this? Is it neutral uh, or is it bad or is it good? So natural gas, which you get from fracking, is uh, creates less carbon dioxide when you burn it for at power than coal, which is why in the partly in the reason why in the UK, since 1990, we have reduced our annual emissions by more than 40%, whilst our economy has grown by more than 70%. And that's mostly because we have moved away from coal towards gas and renewables. But in the end, natural gas still produces carbon dioxide, and we can't stick with it forever. And in the UK, we will need to be phasing out natural gas wherever you get it from, whether you're fracking it here in the UK or shipping it halfway around the world from Qatar, we will have to get off it as a source of power and as a source of heating. And that's going to be a huge challenge, but we know we have alternatives to that, and that's really what we need to do. Very impressive. Thank you, Bob Ward, Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Institute on Climate Change and Environment. Now, Dr. Gerhardt says fossil fuels are converted to heat. The heat expands steam and converts pressure to kinetic energy. This is converted to electricity via generators, transported and then stored in batteries, converted back to kinetic energy. All five steps wasting energy during conversion. And I wrongly attributed this wonderful tweet. Uh, it's actually from my... History Boys colleague, Adam Gariel. I do a series with him on my Patreon page called The History Boys. And I'll read it because it's brilliantly written. Am I the only one who finds it ironic that a Saudi regime that prohibits the teaching of evolutionary science is holding a party in a natural history museum? I doubt there'll be any statues of Darwin being erected in Riyadh anytime soon. Good point. Um, but then there are no statues of anybody uh, in Riyadh 
um, the depiction of human forms in art being forbidden in their philosophy. Let's go to David in Huntley in Aberdeenshire, who think I think knows a fair bit about the subject we've been discussing this last hour. Am I right, David? Quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Uh, you're not quite Huntley. I'm in Banff. <laughs> you're in France. Banff. Okay, Banff. Banff. Banff and Buchan. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I tell you what I'm, I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about everything I hear from CNN to the BBC, even talk news radio, everything about the, the information that seems to be coming through the government papers and been released to the actual public about the fracking. You know, I, I think the public need to understand exactly what fracking is about. And Quadrilla, etc., and several of the government agencies, they only seem to be releasing the bits that they think they'll maybe get away with. They don't seem to want to release to the public the entire A to Z picture of what No, happened. a quadrilla should have come on this show tonight, and well, I would have given them uh, the fair crack of the whip I'd given everyone else. I totally agree. But, however, they, they don't like confrontation, these people. The, <clears throat> later in life, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much retired through injury nowadays, but I have worked all around the world from Colombia right through to Staten Island off the north end of not Staten Island, New York, another Staten Island, which is about oh, a few thousand miles north of Japan. Anyway, uh, I have seen Americans in every place. I've seen their advisors. And it all comes down to equipment. It's very difficult to understand when I say that statement, but... I'll tell you a small story. I got invited one time to go to a big oil show in Houston, in Texas, along with my boss, his boss, and the head of the Big H. Along I went, they were looking at stands. Someone had invented a prototype machine that was an upgrade of their machine that they had cornered the market in the oil service sector for. He turned round to my boss, he looked him up and down, and he says, shelve that. I didn't understand the statement, but it stuck with me. I go back to the office later on, a cup of coffee's on the go, and I said to my boss, I said, what, what did he mean by saying that? Oh, I've been given permission to buy that off that people, buy the prototypes, buy the drawings, and shelve it. And I said, what do you mean shelve it? Oh, everything to do with that prototype will be bought, and it'll be stuck in a warehouse in the middle of the desert at the back of Houston somewhere. And I said, how much is that going to cost? Don't know. I'm waiting on the final figures, Dave. But we reckon about $400 million for one prototype and the drawings. Well, this is capitalism in action, isn't it? As long as we leave the uh, running of the world, the society and its economy, and I put it in that order deliberately, to people who are acting for personal gain, profit rather than public good, uh, and in public good we also uh, have to remember that it's not just me and now, there's us and always to be brought into that equation, uh, then we're always going to be at risk from that, aren't we? Absolutely. I think the, the, the thing, bringing it forward from the story, when it hits the like of Quatrilla, they've got to go in licence now because that machines belong or the prototypes and the, the patents the, all the rest of the developments now belong to the Americans we, we they're always on about in Aberdeen how they've got an oil company producing this it's no more equivalent than a bolt you know it's nothing to do with the machines at all that actually get the oil out of the ground the thing that I'd be worried in the fracking front is how they get the well online not the actual cleaning and blowing out of the well. When they get the well online, the usual way they do it offshore, they've been fracking offshore for since time began. I used to run two uh, maintenance crews that used to operate from South Shields and shipyards right up to the Shetland Isles. We used to look after the fracking boats. We used to put in new pumps, new drive engines for driving the pumps, all kinds of stuff to give you an idea of 
the engines that purely transfer the fluids from the boat to the oil rig are equipped with something like, you're looking at 8,500 horsepower. The pumps, each pump weighs about the back end of eight tonnes. There, and there's about six of them in a row. That's just just to produce, just to move the fluid that they use for going down the well. What they normally do is they drill two parallel holes, or roughly parallel. When they get to a certain depth, they think the the media is that they want to recover. If it's a low density, that's oil with a high water content. They can put a charge down there. They can blow enough. They basically fracture between the two parallel holes. And then at high pressure water, they blow down one well. It goes through the fractures, works its way across. It finds an easy route by the other hole, and it comes back up. Yeah. No, I get that. I get that. Well, away But, I mean, in general, look, gas is good, is what uh, our uh, last guest told us. It's not uh, ideal. Uh, It's also polluting. It's very expensive. It's very difficult to get from uh, places like Russia or Qatar. It's got to travel a long way. I suppose the fracker's point is that if if gas is good, i.e. better than coal, better than nuclear, uh, then um, I suppose the kind of economy we have, people are just going to go looking for it. And even if you've got to find it, under your own feet in the Preston New Road, you're going to do it, aren't you? They are. They, for a long time now, we've been told that there's only so much oil in the world. And, with, you know, if you get told it's something often enough, the public begin to leave it because the public are unfortunately treated from the oil companies as a bit like sheep. And they get fed certain lines, and they keep saying the same line, and they keep saying the same line, and eventually they be- start to... Well, look, I'm out. running out of time. Just tell me in a word. Uh, are you yeah, saying... Are you, so saying are you saying that oil is not running out? Oh, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. There's oil here for the next 150 years. Well, we'll need to talk about that another time, David, because that has implications uh, for Scotland and, indeed for everyone in the world. It's been fascinating. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back next week with another listener. Why don't you? The great Ian Lee is up next. Don't miss him.